Hey, good morning, everybody. We're going to wait a few more minutes to let a, everyone get joined into the session. And as soon as we have uh, enough folks who have joined, we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Burr Foreman Morning Show. Today is September 24th, and we're all with you this morning to discuss the new vaccine mandates and their impact that we anticipate on employers. If you're joining us live, um, we're happy to be with you this morning. It's fall, feels good outside, I'm happy to be here. Um, if you're watching on demand, thanks for your interest. Um, you know, I wanna make sure everybody, everybody knows and understands that this is being recorded, and if there are others that you would like to see this presentation, please let them know. It'll be available on our website to watch at any time. Or, you know, if you just decide that you didn't get enough of us and want to watch again, you should feel free to do that. I'm Brian Smithini. I'm the chair of our Labor and Employment Practice Group at Burr and Foreman. I'll mostly just be moderating the discussion today. I'm joined this morning by Amy Wilkes. Amy is my partner in the Birmingham office, and We've worked together for a, a long, long time, and it's, it's, it's long enough that you may notice Amy roll her eyes at me at some point. Um, whenever I say something she doesn't like, she will make sure that she's clear about that. And, and it might look exactly like, you know, how a wife would act when a, her husband tells the same joke for the hundredth time, because that's exactly our dynamic. We're going to try not to fight in front of the company, but we can't make any promises. Uh, we also have Nafila Helu with us. Nafila is in our Atlanta office, and She's the one who has you know, really done all the work <laughs> to get us ready for this, uh, for this presentation today. Um, Nafla and Amy have both been on the front lines for Burr and Foreman throughout the pandemic, you know, all the way from the, the FFCRA to these most recent executive orders and, and the imminent OSHA standards. So again, thanks for joining us. I think I've got a good group with you this morning to give you some information on these vaccine mandates some insight that'll hopefully help you develop some really good strategies for your workforce. That's the goal today. You know, we, we don't have final and conclusive answers here. We're all just sort of thinking about how these things might go. And, and that's what we're hoping to do this morning is to just offer you some practical guidance. The urgency today is because a brand new massive employer obligation has been announced. And unfortunately, it came with no, one, no instruction manual at all. We're all kind of flying blind into this to some extent because, and, you know, how many times have we said this in the past year and a half? Nothing like it's really ever happened before. So well, let's get started. I'm going to kick it over to Amy to set the table for why we're here, why we've all gathered this morning. Amy, the phrase we're all using more than any other right now up in our offices, I'm sure labor and employment lawyers and human resources professionals all over the country is, vaccine mandates. So exactly what does that mean? And how did it come to be all that anybody's talking about? All right. Well, good morning, everyone. And thanks, Brantz, for that uh, intro. I'll, I'll try not to roll my eyes too often. Um, I don't believe you. <laughs> well, a vaccine mandate is really, it's just a requirement. It's just a requirement that you receive a vaccination in order to engage in some sort of activity. Like, you know, we've seen going to concerts and things like that and going to school. So, um, you know, vaccine mandates aren't new. Um, I think everyone who has kids knows that your kids have to get certain vaccines before they go to schools. Um, you know, what is new and why we're talking about them is seeing them in the employment context. 
I, I think it's you know totally brand new for, for all of us, for an employer or the government to be mandating that you, you get a vaccine in order to go to work. We started seeing them over the summer a little bit uh, with kind of large employers and healthcare settings and the tech industry and certain you know meat packing uh, plants and things like that. But those were all implemented by you know large employers on their own without the government telling them to. Um, and that started kind of ticking up over the summer when the Pfizer vaccine got full FDA approval. And now you know we're seeing that expand out to, according to the Biden administration, potentially 100 million employees. That's about two thirds of the U.S. workforce. So it's definitely at a scale that we have not seen before. So I, you know, that's obviously why we're here, why everyone's been talking about it, why it's been in the news lately. How, how do we get, so what we've heard so far is that there's an executive order that is going to mandate vaccines. And that's really all of the specific information that we know so far. How do we get from an executive order that just generally describes a mandate, but can't actually require an employer to do anything? Um, to an actual rule that employers are going to have to follow. So we're going to have some rules that are going to come out. Um, and, and just to make it extra confusing for everyone, they're going to come from a lot of different places. Um, for federal contractors, it's going to come from something called the Safer Federal Workforce Task Force. They're supposed to put rules out, and guidelines, and what those federal contracts are going to have to have in them for making sure all federal contractor employees are vaccinated. Those are actually supposed to come out today. Um, so we, you know, they haven't come out yet as far as we know, we've been checking, but that's you know, something to watch closely. For healthcare employers, um, those are going to come from a rule um, from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Um, and then for employers with over 100 employees, it's going to come in the form of something called an OSHA Emergency Temporary Standard. And if you haven't heard of that before, you wouldn't be alone because OSHA has only issued 10 of them. Uh, and its history since 1970. It hasn't tried to issue one in almost 40 years. Um, so, you know, it's new um, for a lot of us. So what an emergency temporary standard is, it is if OSHA can show two things, one, that there is a grave danger, there's a hazard that presents a grave danger to workers, and that the standard is necessary to protect workers from that grave danger, they can bypass the normal notice and comment period for issuing standards, which can take months um, and issue what's called an emergency temporary standard effective immediately that would be in place for six months until then they would have to go through the permanent standard process. So, you know, OSHA has thought about doing vaccination emergency temporary standards before one time with the bloodborne pathogen um, standard, you know, many, many years ago with hepatitis B, they considered mandating vaccination for hep B. Uh, then they decided to make it voluntary instead. So this is new for OSHA as well. Okay. Well, and, and because that all confused the hell out of me, it reminded me that um, if, if folks have questions throughout this presentation, things that they want a little bit more information on or specific uh, topics that they want us to address a little bit more, stick those into the Q&A. So we'll keep, we'll monitor that throughout the presentation and try to address some of those questions at the end. We got some questions in advance of the webinar, and we're going to try to hit those as we go. Um, and, and I think Amy's already touched on a couple of those topics that we, uh, that we got before the, uh, before the webinar began. But so, Nafla, you know, listening to what Amy just said, it sounds to me like there could potentially be legal challenges to all this. We've seen media stories that anticipate legal challenges to the vaccine mandates and the way that they're going to be imposed. So let me ask you, um, I guess, the, the, the most co complex and yet simplest question of all, can the government do this? Can it impose this obligation on employers, you know, absent some congressional action? Yeah, and I'm going to give you the lawyer answer of, you know, it depends, and we really won't know about the legality of these until we see the actual rule. But, you know, as you can expect, like you said, there's been a lot of commentary and we have arguments on both sides. You know, on the one hand, there's the camp that says, you know, President Biden has really overstepped his presidential authority. And on the other, some argue that this is well within the bounds of his presidential rights. Right. Um, the folks who say that he's overstepped his presidential authority are essentially saying, you know, the president can't simply order Americans to get vaccinated. Um, you know, that it's kind of, we've got a couple of lawsuits that, um, are coming out or from Arizona raised a lawsuit that said it's not, you know, it's illegal for us to put this on American citizens, but not necessarily 
on you know immigrants who have the option of when they arrive illegal immigrants or have the option of getting vaccinated but it's not mandated so you know there's that kind of argument on the other hand um there's the argument that you know this is generally standard the government has the right to impose vaccine mandates you know that's been established since 1905 with a lawsuit that i don't think anyone knew about before this all came up um but when it said that you know cambridge massachusetts could require everyone to have the smallpox vaccine. So essentially President Biden's approach to this um, involves the emergency provisions that you know, Amy talked about of OSHA. It threatens to withhold the federal funding from our Medicare um, and Medicaid recipients, which is you know, our hospitals and healthcare agencies. But it also kind of, when it comes down to our federal contractors, it's you know, relying on his authority as chief executive um, of the federal workforce. So you know, it's, all, it's all to be seen, but there are good arguments on both sides. And, it'll come down to what actually comes out. What I love is this um, display that we've trained you really well and that you know not to give a concrete answer as a lawyer and that you, you know, this, maybe this, maybe that, but no, that's uh, that's exactly where we are. I think you're right. And, and Amy, I know you've had, um, I know from experience because you've, you've, you've told me repeatedly what your opinions are about this. So do you have any, uh, any thoughts on what Napolo was just talking about, about the legality of, of, uh, of the issue and the lawsuits that have been filed? I, I think if the question is whether it's constitutional, I think that, you know, is a, a much harder road to hold that it's not constitutional. I think there's, like Neville said, there's, there's precedent for it being constitutional. Um, so I think lawsuits like the one filed by the Arizona um, Secretary of State saying that it's unconstitutional, it violates equal protection because um, undocumented, you know, aliens, illegal immigrants aren't covered, but U.S. citizens are. I don't think that's going to go anywhere. I think there are greater legal arguments we made that OSHA can't meet the grave danger um, and necessary to prevent, you know, harm standard. That yeah. this is you know, basically it's not necessary. OSHA hasn't met its standard for such an extreme measure. Yeah, and so for the most part, you know, the folks that are on this this uh, webinar this morning watching this show, they're probably interested in whether it's legal or not. They're interested in what the outcome is going to be for whether the mandates will be enforced. But I think most everybody just wants to assume that they are. And, and so what does that mean? You know, let's assume that these are going to be implemented, that they will be enforceable, and that we as employers are going to have to take action in response to them. So you know, let's just start with the basics, Amy. Who's going to have to comply? Who do we anticipate this applies to? And, you know, uh, of the folks that are watching our show this morning, which of them are going to have to comply with this vaccine mandate? Well, if you're a federal contractor, and I know Nopla is going to get into kind of the details of who that is. So if you're, you know, most people know whether or not you're a federal contractor or not, but if you have contracts or contacts with the U.S. government, um, you know, assuming your contract meets a certain financial threshold, uh, which most of them probably do, then you're going to be covered. Um, and I would expect there would be less room for legal challenges to those rules, just because federal government gets to do what it wants with its, you know, contractors and employees. So federal contractors, if you are a facility um, that is funded by, with Medicare or Medicaid, um, then your workers are going to be covered. And if you are a large employer with over 100 employees, um, then you are going to be covered. Now, there are some others, you know, if you're a, a school that's in part of the federal Head Start program, um, you're going to be covered as well. I think those are going to be coming in 2022. Head Start's already said. So there, there are a couple other smaller pieces, um, but those are the three, um, those are the three big ones. Now, you know, it's not gonna apply to all of every employee at each of those places. OSHA's already said, at least for the 100 employees, um, large workplaces, that it probably won't apply to remote workers. OSHA really doesn't have an interest in, you know, protecting the health and safety of people in their house. That's kind of beyond their reach. So remote workers are probably going to be excluded. Okay, a remote worker is gonna be excluded from the purposes of counting or for purposes of actually having to be uh, vaccinated? Do you know? Well, no. Um, the short answer is no, we don't know until the rules come out. But I think given that the goal of the rules is to get as many people vaccinated as possible, 
my guess would be that remote workers will count for purposes of do we have 100 employees or not, but you will not have to get them vaccinated or test them. I think that's probably right. Um, so that raises the question, though, <clears throat> how do you count to 100? You know, we've got a lot of employers on this, uh, you know, watching this show who uh, have multiple facilities, they have multiple entities, maybe some have less than 100, but they all total more than 100. Is this going to be like trying to figure it out under the FSCRA all over again? I mean, well, that's that's another good question. You know, it, it could be. That's a, that's a re the FFCRA is a recent example of where we were counting employees. In that case, it was, you know, um, 500. And it was complicated. And you had to look at, you know, joint employer rules and temporary workers and contractors and things like that. And it was a headache for everyone who had to deal with it. So it could go that way. Um, I think a way that OSHA could go is, you know, something they're already doing is looking at, okay, well, who, who do we count? We count employees that we would have to list on an OSHA 300 log for uh, workplace injuries and illnesses. And that's, you know, a pretty broad definition of just who's on the payroll, um, you know, who are we paying? But it includes people, you know, contractors, temporary workers, you know, staffing agency employees, you know, it's broader than, you know, I think we thought about under the FFCRA. Yeah, yeah, that's probably right. So sticking with the basics then, Amy, let's let's assume that I'm watching this show and I've got 100 employees or at least close enough that I'm going to feel like I've got to comply. What does it mean? What do I have to do? What is this what is this mandate going to tell me that I am obligated to do as an employer? So it's it's going to tell you that you either need to well, all right, let's, well, for the 100 employees, right? We're not talking about contractors because their, their rules are a little bit different. So for our large employers with more than 100 employees, you are either going to have to ensure that all of your employees are vaccinated or um, they're going to have to go undergo weekly COVID testing. So that's one part. The other part is you're going to have to provide paid time off to employees in order to get vaccinated. And this, I think, is a, a bigger piece to recover from any side effects of vaccination. Right. Yeah, so you might be able to get a vaccine in an hour, but, you know, then we're potentially looking at paid time off for a day or two days or three days or however long someone says they feel bad after the shot. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's the that's the part we're going to have to button up a little bit because I can already anticipate the abuse from uh, from that particular component. And I'm sure all of our 68 participants on this show right now have already thought of that, too. Um, so, yeah, so let's. um Nathala, let's say that we've got folks, I, I, I've talked to clients who have said, you know, if I attempt to mandate the vaccine, I'm going to lose half my workforce. And, you know, whether that's a great thing or not, it, it's simply a practical fact that people are dealing with out in the real world. So let's, let's suppose that an employer doesn't want to mandate the vaccine and elects test. Um, who's going to have to pay for that? Yeah, that's, yeah. that's a pretty common question. Current EEOC guidance that relates specifically to COVID-19, and you know, we've seen a lot of guidance come out over the last, okay, are we at 18 months now? It's all just kind of- Yeah, I think. Holding together. 18 years, it could be years, I'm not sure. Yeah, who knows? Um, you know, it hasn't addressed the specific issue of COVID-19 tests, but the EEOC guidance that came out before COVID-19 required that employers pay the cost of mandatory testing. There, are some interesting points that kind of go into this and there's speculation right now, but you know, insurance may cover the cost of testing. Um, Medicaid has been directed to cover the cost of at home COVID-19 tests. Um, and the Biden administration has said that it will subsidize the cost of rapid at home tests uh, for community health centers and some food banks and some other folks. Um, so practically speaking, we don't exactly know what the costs are, but if we're going by, um, the pre-COVID mandates, then we would want to go ahead and best practice would be to plan to pay for the testing right now. Yeah, I think that's right. Unfortunately, I, you know, it seems to me that there, it ought to be an incentive not to add a specific cost associated with an obligation that employers are going to resist in the first place. But I suspect that that's the way we're headed. Um, so I, I think you're right. We probably, probably should anticipate that. But let me ask sort of the the secondary question to that, which is, if we have elected to test rather than require mandates, are we going to have to pay employees for their time spent while they are actually being tested? 
Yeah, another really <laughs> common question and another one of those question, answers that I'm gonna have is we really won't know until we see the rules and how they come out, but current EEOC guidance under you know, the Fair Labor Standards Act says that employers do have to pay for the time that employees spend waiting for and receiving medical attention, and that would include our COVID-19 test, you know, at the employer's direction um, or on their premises, so during their normal working day. But it does also expand to tests that the employers take on their days off if it's necessary for them to perform their job. Um, so the best answer that we have right now is Yes, if you know your employees fit in that, um, but employers should also note, you know, that we're not allowed to consider these things um, as wages if it's for the primary benefit of us. So we probably don't even need to kind of look at can we consider this part of their pay and such. Um, and for now, plan on kind of paying the cost of the testing and potentially, you know, for some time that the employees have to then taking the tests. You got any thoughts on that, Amy? I think well, we've you. One point I had on the not necessarily the testing piece, but the, the vaccination and recovery um, time. OSHA had like a five minute conference call after the rule was announced to kind of, you know, they, they answered a few questions and they did say that employers would be able to require that employees use their allocated PTO um, to get vaccination and recover. So, you know, we'll see if that makes it into the final rule, but you know, that's what an OSHA spokesman uh, said. Um, so that's, you know, something to look for. That's one of those things they like to do to confuse us because to suggest that they have to use their PTO is to suggest that we don't have to pay for it right. because if someone doesn't have PTO available and we're not obligated by any rule or, or regulation to pay them, but, you know, they're required to use their PTO, that would suggest that we don't have to pay them, that, that they have to use time that has been given to them for that purpose. And I think that's a little bit confusing and we're gonna have to see how that plays out. Um, you know, and, and what Nafila was talking about with the, it's, it's, it's analogous to the donning and doffing, um, you know, to, to the wait time to fulfill an employer obligation. Um, you know, if you've got to put on safety equipment at work, you know, are we supposed to pay for that? It's analogous to that, but it's not exactly the same, you know, because those things are not occurring at our, premises. They're not specifically, you know, on site where we can monitor the time that it takes. And so, you know, I anticipate not just that the standard is going to be complicated, but also then there are going to be challenges to that standard when it's issued for that purpose, because I don't think there's any way to really predict um, how this is going to all play out. And in particular, when, you know, we have decided to elect testing over vaccination. You know, that that uh, that can be complicated. But then on the other hand, Amy, there are going to be some employers that don't want to deal with the ex potential expense. I mean, we, we still don't know. And as, as Napoli said, we're still waiting to see how that's going to play out. But the potential expense and then the unquestionable hassle of weekly testing. I mean, for some of our clients that have thousands of employees, that's really just not even manageable. It's not even realistic to think that we could, you know, weekly test. And so some will want to, you know, choose the option to mandate the vaccine and be done with it. Presumably they could do that right now, right? I mean, that, there's nothing preventing them from, from doing that right now. That's right. <laughs> That's right. And, and OSHA on that same call, you know, the, the testing piece is a alternative way of, the way I view it, a alternative way of complying with the standard. So OSHA has been clear, hey, if you don't want to do it, employers, you can absolutely just mandate everyone to be vaccinated. There's nothing that requires you to allow testing. Outside, aside from a possible accommodation issue, which we'll talk about in a minute. Right. Well, and that's, that's sort of the question I was getting to. Does this standard give the employee the option, the opportunity to say, I want to elect weekly testing, even though employer has said, I'm going with the vaccine option. I'm not going to. I'm not going to uh, provide weekly testing, and we have to allow them to test weekly rather than be 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 you know mandate the vaccine. My sense, based on the statements that OSHA has made thus far, is absent some sort of medical condition or religious exemption where we're allowing testing as a reasonable accommodation to those. 
um, those two things, just an employee doesn't want to get vaccinated and wants to test, I don't think that that would work. Right. I think if the employer decides we don't want to deal with testing, you know, absent some sort of exemption issue, if the employer mandates vaccination for everyone, I think the employee, you know, will have to comply. Yeah, I, that's what I that's what I think too. I mean, it's it, it would sort of swallow the rule if the employee could make the determination on their own and force us into a position where we've got to do both. Now, right. obviously, with you know medical religious accommodations, those are going to exist regardless. We're going to have to manage those, but that shouldn't be an overwhelming number, um, and they'll have to prove it. So no, and I I think what's clear is the purpose of the rules. Are to encourage vaccination. The, the testing piece is there is kind of a, you know, oh, here's another option. But I personally think the idea is to make it so onerous and hard for people to deal with, both the employees and the employer, that people say, oh, you know what, this is a pain. I'm just going to go get the shot and not have to deal with it. Well, yeah, that's the obvious goal, right? I mean, that's the goal. I mean, that's right. why we're doing this is to get more people vaccinated. We don't want to I mean, the Biden administration didn't issue this so that there would be weekly testing. That was not the purpose, right? Um, so I think you're right. I think that's probably the political and economic incentive that is driving everything here. You mentioned a couple of times that it might be a little bit different for federal contractors. And I mean, probably we got a lot of folks watching this show who are federal contractors. So NAFLA, how is it different if you're a federal contractor or if you engage in contracts with the federal government, whether you think of yourself as a federal contractor or not? Yeah, so it's interesting, you know, the conversation about OSHA, about an employee opting into this test is kind of interesting because originally when these came out, we thought that what really differentiated the federal contractors is that it got rid of that option, you know, for the employees to test weekly or for, you know, federal contractors to offer the, the weekly test. Um, so, you know, once the rule is in effect, we understand it that, you know, there isn't that option of you can wear masks, you can do the weekly testing, you can social distance. Um, it's essentially kind of mandating vaccination. Um, you know, Amy, I don't know if you want to expand. I'm trying to keep it a little short so we can get to things, but if you want to expand specifically on some other interesting points you saw. For the federal contractors? Yeah. Well, I did, you know, this has already been in place, um, I think, for federal workers, but I think maybe something that might be new for some people who haven't dealt with it before, you know, for federal workers and some federal contractors already, the government's been requiring basically certificates of vaccination um, for workers. And, you know, there are fines and penalties associated with, um, you know, forging those or having it, it be a fake or something like that. But I mean, that's kind of a, a documentation headache and maintaining that and making sure your employees have that. I mean, if, if they don't, they might not be allowed to work. The contract might get pulled. So there were, you know, specific requirements that, you know, as someone who works mainly with private employers that I wasn't used to, and I think if you're a federal contractor who, you know, maybe hasn't had active contacts with the government or, you know, this is new for you, I think that's going to be kind of a paperwork hurdle that maybe you're not used to dealing with. Yeah, and tying into that, we've seen, you know, I've seen information about um, specific categories for certain healthcare providers. If I'm a healthcare provider and I participate in Medicare or Medicaid, what are the requirements that exist for my company in that scenario? Because I think there's some going to be some specific rules applicable to those as well, right? Yeah, there yeah. are going to be some specific rules. It's going to essentially get rid of the option for weekly testing. Um, I think that this particular industry is the most interesting because it's one of the industries that vaccine mandates are not really new. Um, you know, a lot of employers in that realm, you know, mandate it. I think what kind of is interesting is we don't really know if it's going to apply to dentists. And that's not something I really thought about, but there's a real debate about whether or not this is going to apply to dentists. So, you know, when we talk about, we think we know, but there may be some caveats. If we have any dentist industry people, you know, joining us, there's, you know, some, a little bit of gray area there about whether this is something that you guys uh, will have to comply with. Well, maybe you guys care a lot more about dentists than I do. I've got a, I've got a little bit of a hostility towards dentists, so they can figure it out for themselves. Okay. Um, so, all right, Amy, um, this, you know, this appears to be what we know about the who and the what right now. I mean, there's, unfortunately, that's, you know, there's limited information and we're, and we're all just kind of navigating it as we go. Um, do we know anything more about the when? 
Yeah, so for federal contractors, I think I mentioned earlier, uh, the rules, the, the guidelines from the Safer Government Workforce Task Force it's, um, are supposed to come out today. Um, so, you know, we'll be, of course, monitoring that and, and get something out when those come out. Um, CMS for the healthcare workers has said that they're aiming to get their rules out sometime in October. Um, OSHA, I've seen estimates from two weeks. I've seen eight weeks. Um, the healthcare standard they put out earlier this year took them six months. I would expect this one will come out faster than that. Uh, my guess, you know, glass half full, you know, maybe in October, glass half empty, maybe by the end of the year um, for OSHA. So that applies to the states that are under OSHA's jurisdiction. There are, you know, a bunch of other states that have their own state OSHA plan. Um, South Carolina is one of them, you know, in our footprint. So for those states, they will have 30 days after the OSHA standard comes out to implement either that standard or something just as effective. Um, as far as, you know, when people might have to be vaccinated after the rules are announced, the federal workers were given 75 days. I think that's probably a good kind of ballpark, um, kind of average time. I mean, there's obviously going to have to be some time for employees to get vaccinated after the rules are announced. So I've seen 50 days, I've seen 90 days, you know, 75 kind of hits in the middle of that. So that's a, a good number to have in your head. And we've talked about the fact that there's probably going to be exemptions that we have to deal with. I mean, for sure, we can anticipate that there, there will be um, and, you know, I don't really love to call it an exemption so much as an accommodation. Um, people are not exempt from the rule. They are obtaining, they're receiving an accommodation from the rule, but exemption is the word that seems to be getting used, you know, mostly. So we'll, we'll go with that. Um, those are going to apply, right? I mean, we anticipate that there will still be uh, medical and religious accommodations that have to be made to the standard, correct? Correct. Uh, OSHA has said there will be. Um, the executive order for the federal contractors have mentioned it. Um, I don't recall seeing that CMS has mentioned it for healthcare workers, but I expect, you know, those are existing federal laws. I expect that all of these rules will contain those exemptions. And you're right. It doesn't mean your employee doesn't have to do anything. It means we have to engage in an interactive process for both medical and religious exemptions to determine whether there is some way we can you know, reasonably accommodate this person not getting vaccinated. And the accommodation could be weekly testing. It could be masking. It could be distancing. It could be working remotely. There, you know, we have to go through that process. Um, you know, unless you can show for both that there's some sort of undue hardship on the employer for having to accommodate this person. I think the undue hardship um, burden is, you know, it's, it's a higher bar for medical um, exemptions than it is for religious. But, you know, one thing I'll say about religious, that's the one I've been asked about the most recently. And unfortunately, there's just not a lot of good guidance out there on what's a sincerely held religious belief. And, you know, what First time this has ever been used as much as it's been used. Right. I mean, normally it comes up, you know, with people who can't work certain shifts because they go to church on Tuesdays or something like that. Right. So we've never really used it in this context. So, you know, there are a lot of questions on what is that? Um, you know, one thing I think is clear, you know, a sincerely held religious belief is not a personal political belief, nor is it just a general distrust of government or distrust of vaccines. Um, that probably doesn't meet the standard for a sincerely held religious belief. Um, not saying people won't try and use it, but, you know, that much I think is clear from just, you know, kind of case law and, and what I've seen. But I think the religious exemption is going to be kind of where the action is. Yeah, I think you're right. And, and also the most confusing, the most difficult to process. Yeah. Uh, Nafla, some of our clients have already begun to clear this trail. I mean, we've got clients that have already mandated the vaccine and that, you know, are well on their way to um, complying with this standard when it's released you know, they're, they've, they've already done it. So what can we learn from some of those folks that have, that have, that have cleared the trail and begun to draft policies and procedures? What, what can, what advice do you have to the folks watching this show about how to manage these anticipated mandates? Yeah, I, mean, I 
actually a lot of time prior to the White House announcement, we were having a lot of conversations with clients about the vaccines. You know, if we incentivize them, do we mandate them? You know, what are the pros and cons of going each way? And I think one of the biggest fears that employers, you know, constantly voiced was that they didn't want to alienate workers, you know, and create a large exodus from their workforce, especially given today's labor market. Um, and that was kind of the thing of like, you know, why do we want to create another hurdle to employment when we're already struggling to get, you know, workers in our door? I thought it was interesting. And I, from what I've seen, that hasn't really become true. Um, and, you know, the numbers so far don't support that, uh, you know, but that's, that's really early numbers. We don't know. And we don't know if that's something that, you know, will change as these vaccine mandates kind of go out of more liberal areas, um, you know, in our, like our tech industry, things like that. These are things that are generally a little bit more supported by the employee workforce. Um, you know, the companies I think that were thinking about pulling a trigger on a mandate, but were a little gun shy. I think that the announcement out of Washington was really all they needed. And they said, okay, let's just go ahead and do it. And the context changed from, hey, this is something we're doing to some, to where they could say, this is something that we have to do. And we're just going to get ahead of the ahead of the curve. And I think that that helped a couple of the employers with the fear of being the bad employer um, when it comes to how their employees thought about it. Yeah. Um, you know, as we draft these employees, there are so many considerations that I don't think, you know, anyone really kind of saw coming. And there's a lot of little practical points that we've seen come into play. Um, all of the vaccine mandates that I'm aware of, you know, for a lot of our Atlanta area employers will take effect October 1. Um, but with that, we've seen, you know, how are we going to define a vaccine mandate? Are we going to ma mandate, you know, that everyone is fully vaccinated? Are we going to mandate that people have their first dose by October 1? Um, you know, we've got one who said, hey, you have to be fully vaccinated by October 1. So in that by September, you know, I don't do math very well, as you all know, but by September 7th, you have to have your Pfizer. By September 14th, you have to have your Moderna. You know, don't quote me on those dates, but they broke it down even more saying, you know, you had to have your full regiment. Um, how are we going to approach the idea of boosters? Um, this provides, you know, a whole other rabbit hole that we can go down into. On Wednesday, the FDA approved boosters for certain segments of the population. So our vaccine mandates going to, you know, mandate that people stay up to date with the regiments and those are going to change. Um, for example, FD, the FDA said that they are approved for folks who are, this is only Pfizer. So, you know, we don't know what Moderna or J&J &J is gonna happen, um, but it's been approved for folks who are 65 plus, people who are at high risk um, and people whose jobs put them at severe risk. So, you know, our medical workers, things like that seems pretty common, but there was some questions about, well, does that mean all frontline workers have to get their vaccine, uh, have to get their vaccine boosters? You know, do we have to then ask, hey, which, you know, which vaccine did you get um, in order to monitor that? There was some news that j and is looking at adding a second dose to their regiment because a two-dose regiment gets up to 94% effective, which, you know, helps. Um, so it's kind of a question of, you know, how much information do we have to collect from employees in order to comply with how we define fully vaccinated too? Um, I think that that was kind of interesting because, you know, every regiment is different. So all of that, you know, if we're collecting employee personal information, um, you know, how do we manage that employee personal information? And, you know, managing it, the best way to treat it would be to treat it like we treat other, like we treat other personal health data and store it, you know, confidentially separate from the employee's personnel files. You know, we get a lot of questions of, are we going to mandate that folks upload their vaccination cards? Um, you know, can we put that into a Workday or some other serve um, service? And there's concerns about, you know, well, who needs to know? We currently only have the authority to give medical information on a need to know basis. So we wanna make sure that wherever, you know, if this goes into a Workday sort of system or anything like that, that we are limiting the access to that stuff. You know, we need to protect it. Um, lastly, grace periods. I mean, you know, it kind of, we kind of, touched on a little bit with, you know, if we want fully vaccinated by our deadline, whatever it is. Um, but then we did, we say boosters are included in fully vaccinated. Um, are we going to give folks, you know, a month to get their boosters? Are we going to give them a week? You know, there's a lot of practical points that I think have been really interesting in the actual rollout and practically speaking, because employees have these questions like, okay, you know, do I have to get my booster? 
if it's not an FDA approved thing, you know, it, it's, it's interesting. So kind of defining that just so we have the guidance that we answer those questions for our employees has been kind of the biggest loop or biggest hurdle to jump, I think. Yeah, I think that's right. And, you know, it, it's been, fortunately, um, we've been able to sort of do it as we pleased to some extent um, before the standard has been issued. And there may be more specific ways in which we have to require it now. The cynical side of me is most concerned and has been most concerned for a while about the, the vaccination card itself and a fraud associated with it. I mean, if you've been practicing labor and employment law for 25 years, like I have, you know that like 98% of the people you encounter in a day are gonna lie to you about something. And, uh, and so I'm used to it and, and predict it and just anticipate that I'm gonna be lied to. I suspect we're gonna see a lot of, you know, falsified verification cards, you know, and we're gonna have to come up with policies and procedures for whether, you know, first, whether we're even going to try to address that, and if we are, what are going to be the you know, processes to do that? But it's inevitable that we will receive verif- uh, vaccination cards that are, that are fraudulent and, and that we're going to have to then figure out what to do with those, right? I think it's, I was reading, there was, a, there was an article that came out about a, a lady who altered or uh, faked a vaccination card so that she could travel to Hawaii. Um, and they actually went in and contacted the state that she allegedly had received her vaccination from and they were able the ho- they were able to receive you know confirmation or you know not confirmation that she had not actually received a vaccine because there is the database so yeah. there was com- there you know there's some commentary about is the database going to be something i highly doubt that they'll give us access to a database um well and not only that i mean if i'm the employer do i do i have time to do that i mean let's say i've got 7000 employees around you know, 300 different facilities. Am I going to try to verify every vaccination card? I'll have to hire three HR uh, reps to, you know, deal with that. I mean, Amy, is that realistic? I don't think that's realistic. Um, although an, an e-verify type system for vaccinations seems very, you know, you know, kind of crazy and like out there for me, like that would, you know, could that happen? Sure. Uh, and a year to do that. It'll take at least a year to do that. Uh, well, yeah, that would take forever. I mean, one point I want to touch on, you know, why that won't happen is we haven't talked about OSHA um, and enforcement. Um, you know, OSHA can levy, you know, fines of, you know, a little over 13000 per violation. They said it's going to be serious or willful. But OSHA is an agency without legs. Um, Trump, uh, the Trump administration effectively gutted OSHA. They are very understaffed. They absolutely do not have the resources to enforce a mandate of this size. Um, They will be, I think, depending on whistleblowers uh, reporting it. Um, And even then when they do levy fines, they haven't been able to collect them. If anyone's got an OSHA citation and you fought it, you know you can fight it for, you know, months. Um, so the ability of OSHA to even collect these fines is suspect. I did, uh, I, I have heard rumblings that one thing that OSHA is going to go back to, which had stopped under the Trump administration, um, is public shaming. Uh, if, you know, pre, pre-Trump administration, you might have seen, you know, in the newspaper when some employer gets a big, gets a big citation and, you know, there was press about it. You probably haven't noticed it in the last few years and, you know, expect OSHA um, to start using that again, particularly with, you know, well-known employers to start kind of shaming them into compliance. So I, I think that's a piece we hadn't touched on, but, you know, something to keep in mind with all of this, yeah, okay, I have this rule, but is anyone ever going to try and make me comply with it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're not going to sit here as lawyers and say, you don't have to comply with the rule because that would be bad advice. On the other hand, it's, it's really going to be difficult, um, for OSHA to keep up. You know, you mentioned, uh, you know, they don't have the resources for a mandate of this size. There is no federal agency that has the resources for a mandate of this size. There has never been a mandate of this size that, you know, that I can remember. So um, it's going to be interesting to see how this all plays out. Let's move on. Um, you know, I've been doing these morning shows now for a while and I, I can't, I've probably done a dozen of them. I, I think the most questions we've ever gotten was maybe four in a, in a presentation. 
We currently have 14. And uh, I do not anticipate that we're going to be able to get through all of those, but we will follow up with you to get you answers to these questions. If I don't, you know, if I don't pick yours right now and answer it, um, then we'll get back with you and make sure that we get it answered. And to be honest, I'm going to pick the ones that I think Nafila and Amy are capable of answering because some of these <laughs> seem very hard and they may take some thought and some research. So let's start with the easy ones, I hope. Um, so the first question, can we mandate a vaccine for our contingent and or contract team members? So I got temps, I got contingent workers, I got on-site contractors. Um, I think the answer is that we can, but um, what do you guys expect in terms of the mandate applying to temp workers to, you know, I, you know, presumably their employer would be obligated but, but what is our authority to require verification for folks that aren't our employees? Anybody want to jump on that one? I, I will. I think, you know, again, just given the, the broad nature and the wanting to get as many people vaccinated as possible, I think more likely than not, those kind of periphery employees, um, I, I think they will go, you know, will be covered. Um, especially if they're coming onto your um, work site and interacting with other employees, it defeats the purpose of the, you know, we have to have this to protect people. If half our workers, you know, are technically contract workers, well, they don't have to, and then they're interacting with the others. It, it kind of defeats the purpose. Well, let's back into it too. So my expectation would be if that I'm an, if I'm an employer with 500 employees, and I am using a contingent workforce that comes from a staffing company with 55 employees. I am going to be deemed the joint employer over those contingent workers. And because I'm the joint employer over those contingent workers, I would expect the vaccine mandate would apply to me to require uh, those workers to be vaccinated. I mean, that's you know, just the way that OSHA thinks about things, they're gonna call me a joint employer with those contingent and contract workers. Therefore, I'm going to be obligated by this mandate in the same way that I would be obligated to ensure fall protection from those workers if, if they were working on my side and I was their you know, joint employer. So I expect that that's the answer to that question. You know, when it's phrased as can we, I think clearly the answer is yes. And will we be obligated? I think it's probably also yes, but for a different reason. Another question that we were asked that is similar to this one and, and maybe is, is already answered, but let's just go ahead and throw it out there. Will staffing agencies with 100 plus employees on payroll at multiple companies be required to have their employees vaccinated or will the clients with 100 plus employees be required? I, my, my take on that is that the answer is both. But, you know, Nafila, what do you think about that? I mean, I think Amy essentially <laughs> on the head with terms of they really want to cast a broad net with this. And I think they're going to say, you know, if you're a staffing agency and you, you control the terms and, you know, employment, you know, you are the employer of record for these folks, you know, then they're going to count and you're going to have to mandate it. Um, you know, and I think also it's going to be kind of a double-edged sword where those particular employees are mandated through, you know, their work at the staffing agency, but also because they're on site, I'm an employer that, you know, is required to comply with the mandate. So I think, you know, when, I mean, if you go to the White House website, I mean, it says the whole point is to get Americans vaccinated. Right. And I think that at that point, you know, they're not going, their goal is not to create all these little ways for folks to be unvaccinated. I think they're going to try and cast, you know, the broadest net. Um, so I would say both, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's right. And, you know, again, cynical me, I, I, I have believed since the moment this was announced that the, that the entire point was to make the announcement and that, you know, it is, we're going to do this with the hopes that most employers, especially large employers, would just go ahead and do it before there was even a standard issued. Um, and, you know, to lessen sort of the, the impact, the burden on the government to get this right, because it ultimately doesn't matter if people are doing it anyway. So, I, you know, that's the way that I've kind of looked at it. So I think you're right. It is going to cast as broad a net as possible. Here's another good question. Will businesses be able to partner with testing and vaccine companies to have it done on site? Yeah, I don't see any reason, you know, why not? I, I don't think OSHA cares how you get it done, um, just so long as you get it done. And I think, you know, that's an easy way 
um, to accomplish, you know, either the testing or the vaccination, especially the vaccination. I mean, you know, your, your workers are right there, you know, they get their shot, they wait their, you know, 15 minutes or whatever to make sure there aren't any reactions and they're, you know, presumably back at work. You cut, you cut down on the travel, you know, you're collecting the, the cards or whatever, you know, whatever it is you're doing, you're, you're getting the documentation you need, you know, right then. So I, I think for the employers that have the resources to do that, and if they're, you know, good companies that provide those services, uh, yeah, I think that's a great way to accomplish it. Yeah, I think you're right. Not only do I think that that is going to be permissible, I think it'll be encouraged. I think we'll probably see resources, uh, you know, on the OSHA website, places like that, that, that give businesses ways to locate those companies. Because that's the real challenge, right? It's not, it's not whether, it's like how. You know, how are you going to find somebody that can consistently do this when everybody else in the world is trying to accomplish the same thing? And, you know, honestly, that's what, you know, another issue that I worry about with this mandate is, is the practicality of weekly testing, um, if that's the option that's chosen, when lots and lots of other people are going to be obligated to perform weekly testing as well, you know, how are we going to practically pull this off? And honestly, I think that's one of the defenses that employers are going to have available to them is, you know, if, if OSHA did show up and begin an investigation in response to a whistleblower, one of the responses by the employer might be, are you kidding me? Are you serious? How about you come try to do it? How about you take over my job for two weeks and see if you can pull this off? Because I think a lot of, you know, HR folks are going to be, you know, you know, just absolutely overwhelmed with the process. So that's going to be, you know, one of the challenges. All right. Another good question. What is the criteria? And we've talked about this a little bit um, already, but I think the fact that this question exists is something that maybe we should dive into a little bit more. What's the criteria for exemptions from the vaccine mandate? Is there guidance for employers to use for approving exemptions? How much detail are we going to need? Now, Phil, this kind of comes back to the interactive process, right? I mean, it's just, it's just what we're accustomed to with disability accommodation requests, but cast in a different way, right? Yeah. So for the ADA, I think, you know, maybe I'm going to be a little optimistic here. I feel like that's the easier side of the coin. You know, someone comes to you and says, hey, I can't get the vaccine because I have, you know, X, Y, Z underlying condition or whatever it is. And you would kind of go through the process, the ADA interactive process, the same way you would if someone said they have a lifting restriction, um, you know, and kind of evaluate that, you, you know, how much information you really want to get is the same kind of considerations that we have with other ADA accommodations. I think, you know, Amy kind of talked about, I think the real muddy water here is the religious um, exemptions. And I think that's going to be really hard. You know, we normally see those in terms of work schedules or, you know, uniform. If someone has, you know, some sort of religious that requires some sort of, um, you know, religious compliance with a dress code policy or something like that. But, you know, that we're starting to see it, you know, where folks are saying, hey, this goes against my religion. Um, and it's really not well defined how far we can dig into someone's religion. And it's also kind of interesting, you know. I see if I can, you know, we see a lot of things where folks say, but the majority of your religion says this. And the question isn't, what does the general religion say? You know, what does that person truly believe? I think you can't say, you know, the church came out and said X, Y, Z, but this person disagrees. You know, the standard is really, it has to be their religious belief. Um, there have been some employers that said, hey, if you're, you know, and I'm not a scientist, I don't know what's in these vaccines. I'm, you know, I've, but I know that there was one employer who said, you know, this is formulated the same way that Tylenol is formulated. So can we ask, hey, have you ever taken Tylenol? Um, I mean, it's, it's insane, you know, how far people think they can go down this rabbit hole. And it's just not clear. It's, it's going to be a case by case basis. And you have to. Yeah, yeah detail is going to be tough. I think, you know, for me, it's, it's pretty funny. I mean, we've got people who are claiming, you know, for example, I'm Christian and I have a sincerely held religious belief that I should not receive the vaccine. And the HR managers are mostly like, hey, spell Jesus for me. If you can get past that hurdle, then we will see whether you might have a sincere, but you know, because a lot of times people are just reading this on the internet and saying, oh, well, if I say I've got a, a religious belief, I can, I can get out of it. And it's, you know, it's more than that, right, Amy? Yeah, so one example I've seen is United, 
you know, who's got themselves in a little bit of hot water now with a proposed class action of employees. But United, I believe, was actually requiring a note from a priest or rabbi or, you know, some sort of, you know, religious figure, you know, saying that you're, you know, exempt. Now, of course, those, you know, just like anything, you know, those can be faked and, you know, we've all seen that before. But I think the key piece with both, you know, to the extent you're not already, the request for the exemption needs to be in writing. Um, it needs to be something that the employer gets in writing. So the, you know, have the employee spell it out. I think, you know, develop forms that kind of give some guidelines about what it is and, you know, you make sure you get the information you need. But, you know, point number one is we need it in writing. And then we can go through the, the interactive process. And for, you know, religious, I, I expect, maybe this is wishful thinking, I, I'm hopeful that maybe the EEOC knows that this is, you know, an area and maybe we see some guidance from them at some point. Well, and, and, you know, again, we talked about this earlier, but could an accommodation simply be weekly testing for that specific individual? Because there's no reason to believe that the religious belief would prevent that. Um, you know, so there are options that are available. The most important thing, like Amy and Napoli both said, is the interactive process. It is to have it in writing. It is to then, you know, engage in a conversation with about it to explore whatever this alleged sincerely held religious belief is. Get with your lawyers and try to figure out, you know, what the proper response is. Um, one more good question, and, and three people asked this, so I want to address it before we before we close down today. Is whether people with uh, nat alleged natural immunity who have had COVID, um, is there going to be some sort of exception to the mandate for those people? I think no. Yeah. Um, you know, there's, I mean, that raises all sorts of really complicated scientific questions about how long ago they had COVID, how long natural immunity lasts, your own personal immune response. And I think that is just an area, you know, there's too much scientific uncertainty about it. And I think, you know, that the, the rule is going to be a hard and fast, you know, vaccinated, vaccinated or not. And, you know, they're not going to get into the kind of the, the muddy waters of who has natural immunity and how long it might last. Well, I think yeah, I think you're right. Nathalie, what do you think? I mean, I completely agree. I think, I mean, I, that's one of the areas that I feel pretty strongly, you know, I can say no and probably be right. Um, I mean, we see- That's it, not strongly. You can't say no, I'll probably be right. I mean, that's- Come on, like, have some courage well, of your convictions, Nathalie. I know, well, that's the most confident I felt about anything since COVID really started. Right. So, you know, we'll see. But I think, you know, it's similar to like, flu vaccine mandates. A lot of employers, especially in the healthcare industry, you know, have flu vaccine mandates and they're every year. I mean, it doesn't matter that you got last year's flu um, and that's allowed. And, you know, so hopefully, you know, maybe we'll be able to rely on that a little bit, but I think, you know, the natural immunity is like Amy said, it's a, it's a slippery slope. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, and I think that that is probably where we should stop this morning. There's some other questions that I think are very specific that we will follow up. Uh, well, let me ask, before we do, this This was the very first question that was asked, and it was one that, frankly, I don't know anything about. Maybe you guys do. Is there a formal definition of grave danger as used under the mandate? Do you guys know what the phrase grave danger references? There's a, they talk about it being like a you know, a toxic substance or a, an imminent danger. I don't know that there is a, I haven't seen it. Um, maybe I just missed it. I have not seen a formal OSHA definition that this is what grave danger is. And you know, maybe they have one, but just knowing how federal agencies work and how, you know, this, these standards are challenged, I would think they would want to be as vague as possible. Um, the more specific you are about what is and is not grave danger, the less likely it is that you're going to be able to show that what you're you know, saying is grave danger is a grave danger. Um, so if I'm OSHA, I want to be vague about what that is. Well, if anyone has watched A Few Good Men, Colonel Jessup defines it pretty clearly when um, danger, is it a grave danger? Is there any other kind of danger other than grave danger? I think maybe that's the way we look at it. If it's dangerous, consider it grave, right? Um, so yeah, I don't. I think you're right. I don't think there's been a formal definition. I don't anticipate that we're going to get one. Um, so you know, it's probably going to be up to us as lawyers to interpret what that means and you know, rec uh, advise our clients based on what um, 
you know, all of these, all of the language in these orders mean. And that's, and that's really a good place to, to stop with this. I, th I think that I can tell just by the number of questions that are continuing to come in, we're now up to 18 questions instead of 14, um, that you guys are as confused as we are. And you guys are uh, looking for answers just like we're looking for answers. And so we provided this morning show this morning to start talking about what those questions are and what we should be thinking about and what we should be looking for as these uh, standards are issued, as these regulations come out. And it's, it's, a, it's, it's a continuing story. You know, this is something that we anticipate we'll be following up on in a couple of weeks when we start to receive more information. You know, we'll, there will be alerts posted on our website. We're gonna, we're gonna do everything we can to provide as much content as possible to answer all of these questions for you and then to get back together to talk about it again. So reach out to your lawyers, reach out to Amy or Nafila. Um, we are here to help. We're here to answer your specific questions. I've mentioned that we'll follow up with those of you who asked questions that we didn't specifically answer um, after we end this presentation. But thanks again to everybody for joining us. Um, we were happy to have you here. Um, I hope that you all have an, an absolutely great weekend. Thanks again.